Hello, my name is Simon Benjamin and this is lecture 7 in uh, my series on Fourier series, Fourier transforms and partial differential equations. This is the penultimate lecture and we're going to wrap up our thinking about diffusion, which uh, includes uh, diffusion of heat and also of matter such as gas or an itinerant species of atom that can move through another material. We've been looking at a bunch of scenarios there and we're going to look at uh, the last of those today. So I'm going to start by um, covering something I didn't quite manage to get to in the last lecture, uh, which relates to the proper way to extend a Fourier series uh, when we want to take a situation that's defined only between two points only over a region, and we want to make it into a periodic function. And then I'm going to think about uh, the scenario where you have a pulse of energy that instantaneously heats up part of a material, and then that heat uh, dissipates. And then... We are on to, and then we will look at something, it's not really too bad, but it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of the toughest thing in this course, which is a scenario that will lead us to something called the error function, uh, which is the, the, the path to get there, and dealing with the error function is kind of tougher than the other elements of mathematics in the course. So uh, yeah, I drew this little sketch to just warn you that you may need to have a you know, strong cup of coffee before we, before we embark on that part of the journey. Hmm. Now I've just had a look at all the material that I'd like to tell you about in this lecture, and it's a lot. And I'm a bit worried that um, some people like getting into the details of how tricky maths works, and other people don't, and would just like to understand the main physical messages, the main sort of science message. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of the most complex math as maths aspects and put it into a short additional lecture that uh, is just for the connoisseurs, <laughs> and uh, I'll make it very clear when there's some material in that additional lecture, um, so that if you like you can juggle backwards and forwards between them, but we'll just keep the essentials in this lecture, otherwise I think it would overrun, or I would have to present things at super speed, and I don't want to do either of those. And the first thing uh, that I will put into the supplementary lecture is the stuff that's left over from last week about um, further practice at taking a finite uh, initial condition and making it into a periodic function. So that will be the first thing in the supplementary lecture seven. Right, so just before we, we get into some new material, let me uh, uh, say, as I usually do, that um, the notes for this course can be found at this location, simonb.info. Okay, so moving on, now I'd like to think about the following situation. Uh, I want to imagine that we are going to deliver a pulse of energy uh, to a material at time t equals zero. So at that instant t equals zero, the material, uh, say let's say an infinitely narrow region of the material, it could be at one end or it could be in the middle, receives a, a finite amount of energy. So its energy density will be you know, enormous, technically infinite in that instant, but then it will spread out. Now, in order to get at this problem, I want to uh, go back to the first thing that we did when we were thinking about diffusion, which was a related problem, and that's the one that's showing on the screen here, um, uh, with a little bit of extra colouring that I've done since, where we thought about what would happen if we blowtorch the middle of a bar for a finite amount of time so that there was a distribution of um, excess heat energy in a finite region of the bar, or uh, focused on, let's say, x equals zero, and then what would happen? And we guessed that maybe if it was a Gaussian distribution, um, so the temperature had this Gaussian uh, shape to it, then uh, it would keep that shape and just spread out over time. And following that guess, in the best tradition of solving differential equations by guessing an answer and then just seeing if it will work, we showed that it did work. And I also mentioned back then that uh, because of the symmetry of the problem, and in particular the fact that the hottest point at all times would be at, time, at t x equals zero. Heat would never flow across the x equals zero line, it would only ever flow outward, and that therefore it was kind of a still point in the problem, and you could slice the bar at that point, and mathematically uh, just half of the bar on its own, such as the positive x half, uh, would, would still conform to exactly the same mathematics. And that's all summarized here on this slide. Now what I want to think about is uh, what happens if we deliver our energy not 
uh, into a sort of Gaussian distribution, or rather not a Gaussian distribution with a finite spread to it, but all in one instant, um, which is perhaps easier to think about in the lower one of these two examples. Maybe uh, we've used some very high energy source like a laser to pump energy into the surface of a material. But again, mathematically, it won't matter whether we consider it to be at one end or uh, at, in one plane of the material, as in the upper figure. Um, so we'll probably just keep on using that upper figure because it's just slightly more... Um, uh, uh, the integrals that we'll do, things like minus infinity to infinity, is just easier to remember that than always um, only doing half the bar. All right. Now here was the solution that we found when we guessed a solution and then worked through it. Uh, it's quite a long expression, but the key part of it was... Um, well, up here, of course, so that uh, the form of the distribution of where the temperature was raised remained a Gaussian centered at x equals zero. And also here, so that the um, amplitude of that heat pulse, if you want to think of it that way, was being reduced over time um, gradually. So as time increases, we divide by root t and the height goes down. And then you remember that the trick we used uh, was that we said, well, well, actually, to keep our expression reasonably neat, we'll say that time, we define the start point of when we're watching to be some finite time, which then gives us a finite width to our distribution. And uh, we just figured out what to call that first moment on the stopwatch, uh, given that we had a character characteristic width of the Gaussian that was uh, we were writing as L in it, initial. Now, uh, nothing stops us. This is a solution that, that works generally for any uh, x and t variables we put in. So we can certainly run time further backwards. Uh, and of course, what we would see then is that the Gaussian, uh, as we ran time backwards from our previous initial moment t in it, our Gaussian would become more and more concentrated and would be a more and more extreme peak. And so that's effectively what, what we want, right? So if we ran t all the way back to zero, our Gaussian would have a zero width. Uh, it would have essentially an infinite height. So it's a bit of an artificial limit, but still that's what we want. Um, and would it work? Well, it will because the total amount of energy in our Gaussian uh, pulse is the same at all times. That was one of the things that uh, we verified when we derived this solution, and I'll just check it again now, um, because we assumed that no heat could escape from the bar after the start point of our process, so it would only uh, diffuse through the bar, but it wouldn't escape out of the bar, and therefore the total amount of energy um, is conserved, which means we can run time all the way back to time t equals zero, and even though in that limit we'll get a spike, still the the integral over that, which would give us a measure of how much energy we'd put in, is still just some constant. Let's look at that now. So um, we could say that the energy, um, we won't worry about the energy and sort of the background energy in the bar. So the bar away from, or if we had not injected this heat, then the bar's temperature would be just uh, theta subscript C everywhere. So that's just kind of the, the default energy. We're not interested in that. We're talking about the extra energy we put in. So what we can say is that, uh, let's write it like this, the energy that we've put into the thing must be some integral along the whole, uh, the whole scope of the bar, the whole width of the thing, times, let's say, the heat capacity. I'll use subscript L to mean the heat capacity per unit length, because I don't want to start worrying about the cross-sectional area of the bar. Um, and then times this temperature, uh, the transient part of the temperature distribution. So um, that whole thing that's above, uh, so I'll move things around a little bit, put the constant in front. And because it's uh, an integral over x, uh, time is regarded as a constant, so we can uh, put our 2 root alpha t in front, and then we just have an integral over our Gaussian part here. Now, my claim is that that is, in fact, not a function of time. This is the amount of energy, excess energy, that's in the bar. It's always the same. It just spreads out more and more thinly. It looks like it's a function of time because it's got time in two places. But, uh, as you can probably guess, 
If we just change variable, we'll get rid of that. So let's do that. So there I've taken the opportunity to take the uh, heat capacity and bring it out in front. And you can see there's no longer a time coordinate in the problem. Uh, we were previously going between uh, negative infinity and positive infinity um, for x. And with our scale factor in front for any finite time, and we will be able to see how the t equals zero is a limit of this, um, the, uh, the limits are still minus infinity and plus infinity. And conveniently, our 1 over root alpha t was exactly what we needed to bring into the integral to uh, allow us to change variable. So now in this expression, we see that it is a constant that doesn't depend on time and only depends on characteristics like if we take a snapshot at one moment when the peak temperature is theta h and the characteristic width is L, L in it, then uh, that tells us, along with the heat capacity, how much energy we put in. In fact, um, this integral over here on the right, it, uh, it now has none of our constants in it. Um, it must be equal to just some some physical, uh, some um, mathematical constant, it, it is. It's actually equal to root pi. And um, I'll show you how to get that later on in the lecture, but for now I just want to uh, rock on. So having got that expression for the energy we put into the problem, we could rewrite our original expression at the top here uh, to focus on the fact that we're putting a certain amount of energy in. Let's do that. So there we are, we can just about fit everything we've been doing on the screen. There's the old way of thinking about things. When we specified that at some time we were calling the first interesting moment, there were certain characteristics in terms of the temperature difference and the characteristic width of the uh, Gaussian. And the new way of thinking about things just focuses on the fact that we put a certain amount of energy, capital delta E, in, and there's a heat capacity. Um, and then I've written the whole interesting part of the function here in brackets. And uh, there's a particular reason why I've written it like this and even brought in the root pi. And it's the following reason. Um, this particular, the thing inside brackets, as we integrate from minus infinity to infinity through that, it always gives us one. We've derived it that way, but just to check, all right? So if I'm calling that thing uh, f of uh, x and t, just for the time being, and now I want to just instantly persuade you that uh, the integral for over the complete range of x will always be 1, regardless of the value of t. Well, it's really very similar to what we just did, but let's do it quickly. And here we see uh, all we need to do is the trick we did before, which is the same change of variables to x prime, where we absorb in that x over 2 root um, alpha t. And that will give us then our integral. prime squared, that should be, uh, e to the minus x prime squared. So, um, and I told you, and we will be seeing later, that that integral is equal to root pi, so the whole thing is equal to just 1. Now, why is that interesting? It's interesting for the following reason. Um, if I now would like to ask, what does my uh, temperature distribution look like as I wind t all the way back to 0, as I concentrate all the energy into one infinitely thin slice or region, then um, I can, well, this is still the correct expression, but now we need to take the limit of it as time goes to uh, zero. And it turns out that there's a, a well-known function that is exactly the thing we want. We want a function with the following properties. So at time t equals zero, of course, we've always got our boring background theta c temperature, which is throughout the entire bar. But now I want this I want a function here. Let, I'll give it its symbol and then we'll discuss it. Um, so there's a delta symbol, lowercase delta and x. And what properties do I want from that? Well, I would like it to be equal to infinity at x is equal to 0 because I've put all the energy at x equals 0. But I'd like it to be equal to 0 for x anywhere else, positive or negative. And crucially, I would like that the integral of my function delta x dx over the complete range, but crucially over that zero point, is actually equal to one. So even though my function goes to infinity, um, it's only doing that in an infinitely narrow region. And so when I integrate across it, I just get some constant. Now that thing is what's called the Dirac delta function. Uh, it's very, very interest, uh, interesting, yes. And <laughs> what I meant to say is it's very, very uh, useful 
in um, mathematical physics in analysis of problems. It's a very handy thing to be able to use as a tool. Here, we found that the Dirac delta function is exactly um, how we can describe our heat distribution as time goes to zero. How does that help us? First, let's make sure we really understand what we're saying. So here, just one more time, is the difference between what we're doing now and what we did uh, last time we investigated this kind of thing. At the top is when we said, uh, we'll start the clock at a particular time when there's a Gaussian of finite width, and then we'll see what happens after that. And then we had, of course, our characteristics, which was, what is the width at that particular time? We're calling the start time. What is the peak temperature? And of course, it drops to the lower temperature elsewhere. Now we're winding the clock back to time t equals zero when we're saying, I, that's actually what I now want to focus on, that, that, that initial moment when all the energy is concentrated. So I haven't really, I can't, so I, I sort of drawn the diagram as uh, at some very, very small time, uh, more than zero, because I've sort of indicated here as ever so, oops, and ever such a slight um, uh, sort of uh, curve to this thing, but really the spike is infinitely tall and infinitely narrow at exactly time t equals zero. And here is our, our function again. So we just have the uh, amount of energy we've dumped in um, divided by the specific heat capacity per unit length. So that makes sense to turn the energy into a temperature. And then our Dirac delta, delta function, which will actually boost that up to infinity at x equals zero, but uh, zero everywhere else. So everywhere else, the bar is just at the, the default temperature theta c. Now, the reason to do this is we can actually solve that initial condition, even though it's uh, sort of taken strictly, it's unphysical because we put infinite energy in there. But we can understand that, you know, this is an approximation to a scenario where we have put a lot of energy into a very, very uh, narrow region. Mathematically, we can tackle this, as it turns out. And the way we'll tackle it is with a Fourier series. We have, excuse me, a Fourier transform. We can't use a Fourier series. Why not? It's because our problem it doesn't have either of the two conditions we need for it to be a Fourier series problem. It's not periodic. We just have a bar here and we put some heat into one point and it's not defined over just a finite range. This is an infinite bar. Or if we do the half problem, then a semi-infinite bar. So we can't use either of our Fourier series tricks and we have to go for the Fourier transform. But fortunately, this is a fairly easy use of the Fourier transform. So here's the plan. What we're going to do is try to figure out how to use the Fourier transform representation to describe our initial condition. That will be a way to show how a infinite um, continuous range of frequencies can build our initial condition. And then we'll hope that we can use the same tricks we've been using for the Fourier series to upgrade that initial condition that is only for time t equals zero, instantly upgrade it to the full solution for all time. But first, we need to describe the initial condition um, properly as a Fourier transform. So the only interesting part of the initial condition is certainly not this offset temperature. We can put that back in at the end. Uh, nor this constant, which isn't going to do anything. We can put that back in at the end. What we care about, of course, is this delta function. That's the interesting thing, this spike. How can we describe that? So what we're asking is really this. Our Fourier transform is defined as being the integral from minus infinity to infinity of some weighting function, f of k, e to the plus i kx dk. So the integral sweeps over all possible frequencies, and the weighting fun function tells us how much of each frequency we need. And then we also know what that weighting function is, uh, or at least how to start out. We start out by writing that it is the integral of the function we're trying to build and then minus i uh, kx dx. So it looks over the whole range of the function and figures out how much of each, fre if each frequency it needs in that way. Now it turns out that when you put the Dirac delta function into an integral, it just selects the value of the integral at zero. Very interesting. So what we're going to find here is that this is the easiest Fourier transform we've ever done it's just going to be uh, equal to e to the i minus i k times zero. That's it. <laughs> and so, in other words, it's just one. So let me write that again, just generally. So if you're 
working with the Dirac delta, Dirac delta function, and you have any function at all, I'll use g because we were already talking about f of x. It just gives you back the value of the integrand at x is equal to 0. So um, that's what we're using there. And uh, that's made it, uh, uh, the, as I say, <laughs> extremely easy for, easy for your transform. So what we're saying then is that, yes, we can build our initial condition, our initial spike, as and put it in as an integral form. And it's this. It's just the integral of all possible frequencies. Oops, excuse me. I was about to write dx. There we are. And now, does that make sense? How can that be an integral representation of the thing we want? So what this is, we've written it down, but does it make sense? Can we just check? Well, it's always difficult to stare at a, a complex uh, exponential, I think. But fortunately, we don't have to here. Although it's good to work with the complex exponential, it's very compact. But we can write this as just the exponential over the uh, cos and sine parts of this uh, e to the i k x, but then notice that the sine part uh, will have to be zero because it's an, in, it's an odd function integrated over symmetric limits. So we will just get cos of k x dx. Now, what does it mean when x is equal to zero? Then we are integrating over cos of zero, which is just one, from minus infinity to infinity. So that will indeed give us the infinite value at x is equal to zero that we want. And how about when x is not equal to zero? Well, that's difficult to uh, sort of picture in one's mind, but we can at least see that if x is just equal to some value, like, I don't know, 1.3, as we consider all different possible k's in this integral, we'll actually get all different possible values that cos can return, um, ranging from plus one to minus one, and forever oscillating backwards and forwards between that as we consider different k values. So it's perhaps, this is far, this, this hand wavy word argument is far from a proof, but it's perhaps intuitive to see that we get a kind of interference or cancellation everywhere except at x equals equal to zero. But that's, uh, that's by the by, we've shown that this expression is the correct one to use. And now we can ask, how does that help us with our, with our heat flow problem? Well, now, it's maybe helpful to remember what we would have done if we were just dealing with a Fourier series at this sort of moment. If we were dealing with a Fourier series, we would have had our temperature t equals zero um, limit, or some interesting part of it, having ignored constants and so on, and it would be equal to some sum over our sines and cosses. So let's say it would be a n cos 2 n pi over l something like that. And then we uh, remembered that cos uh, terms are solutions of our diffusion equation, provided that each cos term comes associated with a exponential sine term. So if, and this is where we have to decide, is it a heat diffusion or a matter diffusion, because we use a symbol alpha for one and d for the other. This is a heat diffusion problem, so we should write minus alpha um, k squared, so that whole thing in brackets, squared t, so that thing there. And as long as uh, we do that, we've instantly upgraded our Fourier series. Here it was a cos-based one, but it could have cos and sine. We just follow the same rule. We've instantly upgraded our series that describes the boundary condition to now be uh, a series that describes the full time-dependent problem. So in other words, we, where we see a cos or a sine or indeed a, an e to the i theta, so a complex exponential, any of these functions, all we need to do is throw in the appropriate uh, damping term, the appropriate time term, and we've completed our process. Can we do that here? Well, we instead of a sum, we've got ourselves an integral. But the answer is yes, we can do exactly the same thing. So if I want to now upgrade this uh, object. If I want to now upgrade this from just the x uh, to finite time, all I need to do is throw in that appropriate, uh, let's do it for cos first, 
false k x, it needs to go along with minus alpha k squared t, and uh, I just um, do my integral. Hmm. Uh, excuse me, uh, that looked a bit wrong. The integral, of course, is over k, because we're building it by sweeping over all possible frequencies. Just in the same way that this worked for a series, it also works for the integral, which we can think of as simply the limit of a series, as we had a whole lecture about this, where we would take our series to have a longer and longer um, cycle length until eventually um, uh, we ended up with a continuously varying frequency. So because of that um, uh, limiting, because the integral is just the limit of the series, we can still do this. We can put in our time dependence in this fashion and we're done. So that is the solution. Uh, all we would need to do is remember what this f object was. Well, it was just uh, the way we were writing um, our Dirac delta function, though uh, we need to go back and substitute in to our expression. Let's do that. So there we are, I've underlined that with a dashed line because that is the solution. In a sense, we're done and we could just walk away at this point. But it isn't the same kind of solution we've obtained before where we're able to actually do the integral and leave it in a non-integrable form or a non-integral a non form. Yeah. So can we do that in this case or do we just have to stop? No, we can do it. We can do it. So in fact, um, we saw that the cos way of writing things and the complex exponential are just the same. It's helpful to switch back to using the complex exponential in order to work on this a bit more and trying to get it into the final nicest form. So let's do that. Actually, I've realized the neat thing to do is first to change variables and then to complete the square. So um, first we'll just change to, we'll call it k prime, just to absorb in some of the, just to rearrange things and make it look a bit neater. Okay, there's step one. I've just used a uh, rescaling of our variable and that's meant that I've need, needed to um, have a term out in front there in order to um, provide the constant I need to complete that change. Still, I'm in integrating from minus infinity to infinity, and now the messy part of the uh, integral has appeared up here. So uh, I would like to neaten it up a bit more, so let me write one more line out where I'll introduce a new symbol for that. Okay, doke, that's got it looking about as neat as I can make it, I think. I've used a symbol gamma, which is um, x over alpha root t. That's the same ratio, by the way, of x to square root of t that we're seeing coming up again and again in these heat problems. And it's what I need to put in in order to make my, make my integral as neat as possible. And now it is time to complete the square. I think I because uh, the k prime is just a dummy variable and I can use anything at all, I'm now going to drop the prime because it get, it's just messy to keep on writing primes. I hope that doesn't cause any confusion. Now let's do this complete the square business. What I've written down here is that I've, uh, I note that because we've got two exponentials, we can just add the terms in the exponent, of course. But I could write it even more neatly as the square of something up there in the exponent if I had one further term that I, I don't have, which um, would be, well, it would be the missing bit. There would be what I get if I square the gamma, which would be minus and then minus one from the i squared, gamma squared over four. So if I had that extra term, I would now be able to write the exponent in the form I have. Um, but I can always give myself that extra term because it's just a constant by multiplying by some appropriate um, external factor. So here where I've written a question mark, we can see that what we need to put in is exactly uh, the same thing as I've written here, but with a minus sign. So that would then, in order to cancel that, uh, I would need to put that um, e to the plus gamma squared over 4, and that's exactly the term that I need in order to legitimately rewrite the exponent with that squared form. So maybe just take a, a stare at that if that's a trick that you haven't seen before, but it's a good trick because now, of course, what I'm going to do is change variables once again and hopefully now the integral will look very simple. Well, uh, does it look simple? I've used a, I don't think we've used the symbol y yet, so I've introduced that. Um, it's just a shift to our uh, variable k, but it's weird because it's a shift by adding an imaginary part. Now that makes, that 
it's fine mathematically. I can still uh, replace the, the dk is now just equal to dy because the constant goes away. Regardless that it's uh, imaginary, it's still a constant and it will just go away. And that all seems very nice, except when I write down the limits of the inter integral. Now it's going to look a little bit peculiar because it's going to be from minus infinity um, minus i uh, gamma over 2 to plus infinity minus i gamma over 2. Because when I put in k uh, is equal to plus or minus infinity, I now have those, um, those shifts. And that looks like an integral that maybe uh, most people watching this won't have seen before. A strange integral. We, we, we normally only ever integrate over the real axis. What does it mean to integrate over the uh, with this sort of shift into the imaginary space? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just tell you that in this case it doesn't matter and we can just drop those terms. But in a moment, I'm going to justify why. But I know that some people maybe don't care and they'll be able to skip it. So let me just power on for now and say that I can just drop those uh, little sh imaginary shifts to the limits. So there I've written it out again uh, without the funky shifts in. And uh, we can see that that must just be equal to some quantity. In fact, we've met this before. And we I, I asserted that it was root pi. I'm going to assert that again, but... It, Again, momentarily, I will justify that for those who are keen to feel that they've grasped every step. But that will then give us 1 over root alpha t, and then we're going to have a root pi, uh, excuse me, a root pi on top, e to the minus gamma over 4. There we are. So we've done that integral. Uh, how has that helped us? It helps us because it allows us to go back and write our solution in a neater form. Let's remind ourselves why we were even doing this integral. We were doing it because it was this part, let's change color, this part of our solution. And we wondered whether we could write it in uh, as a completed integral rather than just leaving it in integral form. Well, now we can. So I will now write out this line, but with the solution we found in place. So there it is as just a direct substitution, but now let's um, tidy it up and put back in what that gamma squared quantity is equal to. And there we are, uh, just um, substituting back in and neatening up slightly. That is exactly the expression we found before by taking the limit of our former guessed solution, the solution we guessed and filled in, winding it back in time, so that all the energy concentrated to one location, and then writing it down. That's what we found before, and now we've derived it from that initial starting point of all the energy in at one value of x, but using the Fourier transform. So the point is, this time we didn't have to guess. This time we just took that initial condition and systematically took the Fourier transform, put in the time factor, found that we could do that integral, and we've come to this solution. So we don't need to guess. We can just solve these things directly using the Fourier transform. Now, in order to get to this nice solution, I did take two uh, very quick uh, steps over some interesting stuff. Uh, namely, um, there was the stuff about uh, why is it okay to ignore these imaginary shifts to the axis of integration? And also, uh, how do we work out what this integral here of the Gaussian is? Those things, I think, are good choices to put in a little, uh, the little supplementary lecture. So go and have a look there. That will be the second topic of that lecture if you're interested in knowing them. And by the way, they're really interesting, especially the one about coming off of the real axis. That hints at something called contra-integration, which is my, more or less my favorite thing that I learned in maths at university. But it's not essential for understanding diffusion and getting the main physical message. So also don't feel bad about skipping it. All right, now the very last problem that we're going to meet whilst thinking about diffusion, before we get to have some fun with some wave uh, topics next in the next lecture, is the following. The very last one seems like a very innocent one, a very simple one, but it isn't. All right, so here is the story. We have a reservoir of some material. So again, by the way, this can be thought of either as a heat problem 
or as a matter diffusion problem, as with all the things we've looked at. But since we were just talking about heat and a pulse of energy coming in, now we'll talk about matter diffusion. Uh, what I'm about to describe uh, comes up in material science, for example, in the carburization of steel, where you want carbon to penetrate into steel a certain depth in order, in order to alter the surface properties. So you can expose a piece of metal to um, a, a, a gas, essentially, um, and you need to know the conditions in which to do this so that you will get the right amount of impurity going into your metal to achieve the desired results. So it's very interesting what we're about to describe. Um, and as I say, it seems very simple. So we have a reservoir and it is it has a fixed concentration of some material. We could think of this as carbon. So it has a fixed amount of carbon in the reservoir. That will never diminish its permanent. And we call that, in this problem, uh, C for concentration uh, subscript S. And then we have a block of material and it has its own concentration of the substance in question, which here we've written as C in it, throughout the entire block. Now the thing about this block of material is it goes on forever. So it starts at x is equal to zero, and we can imagine it's a three-dimensional block, so then we have a, an xy plane, um, but we only need to think of it in one dimension because the block is so big that there's uh, that um, <clears throat> the fact that it eventually has uh, limits in the x and y direction, excuse me, in the y and z direction doesn't matter to the physics of what goes on uh, near the surface in near the origin of our coordinate system. So we essentially it is a one-dimensional problem, but the block has no uh, end to it. It's essentially infinitely deep. In any real problem, of course, your piece of metal is not going to be infinitely deep, but also you're only going to be uh, penetrating into it a, a, a really a very shallow depth. So in many realistic situations, the block is effectively infinite in that no particles of carbon will uh, permeate all the way through the material and get to the other side. So it may as well be infinite, and it is in, in the mathematically abstracted problem. Now we can assume that the uh, density of uh, the material in the reservoir is higher than the natural or initial density inside the material. So what will happen is, yes, material will come in from the reservoir and it will enrich the concentration within the block of material. But the interesting twist is it will never stop doing that. Material will keep coming in from the reservoir forever and the block is infinitely deep, so it will never reach a steady state. It will just keep on taking in more and more of this material. Now to tackle this problem, uh, at, we're going to be using, uh, I think, some of the tricks we've already used in this lecture, and a couple of other ones, and I would say that this problem is the most advanced one in the entire course. It's the first time, I think, that many viewers of this may end up meeting an integral that cannot be done. Right. So um, maybe make yourself a strong cup of coffee or go to the window and take a last look out at the sunlit world and then come back here and we'll, we'll face this, uh, this challenge of an integral that cannot be done. Maybe if there are any young people in the room, ask them to leave so that they don't have to <laughs> face the reality of this thing that's called the error function, which we will get to quite quickly because of all the techniques that we've learned. Let's go. First, I'm going to sketch the initial distribution of material, and that's, uh, that's always how we start these things out, by describing the time t equals zero condition. There it is, pretty simple. The high concentration Cs in the reservoir region, the low concentration C in it in the uh, block region, all at time t equals zero. All right, so mathematically, how would we write that down? Like this. As usual, we want to uh, remove the the, the static and, and uninteresting parts of the problem and just put them back in later and focus our mathematical analysis on the simplest thing we can, taking all constants and scaling out. So I've introduced some function s of x and t to capture what the interesting step-like behavior and the rest of the constants, well, we have the uh, concentrations and the difference in concentration here. So what do I need this s function to be like? I want it to be equal to plus one for x is greater than zero, because if I put in one for the s value, it will remove, the cs will be taken away and I'll just get c in it, that works. I want it to be equal to zero for x is equal to zero. 
because then I will get that at the surface of the block I have this higher concentration. So I'm taking it that because the surface is in direct contact with the reservoir, it, even at time t equals zero, has the high concentration. Now, just because it will be mathematically convenient, I'm going to choose minus one for x is less than equal to zero. Now that's actually, in a sense, wrong, because that would give me the wrong concentration in the reservoir region. But I'm doing this because I don't care. I'm not trying to describe the reservoir region. Whatever the math says about the reservoir region, I override that because I know that it's just fixed. My challenge is to describe mathematically what's going on inside the block. So it's only the first two conditions that matter from the point of view of getting it right, in, correct, getting it correct inside the block. The, uh, my choice for the third of these is just a mathematical convenience that will make my analysis a bit easier. So there's a trick there. This is the, uh, my scaling function at time t equals zero, and I'll give it its own name. I'll call it r at x. So rx is this boundary condition, and it's a pretty simple one. Let's draw it. There we are. So rx simply switches from minus one to plus one at x is equal to zero. A very nice, simple function. What I want to do, as in the previous example we looked at, is to describe this initial condition using, well, I can't use Fourier series, so I'll need to use a Fourier transform. Um, but hopefully it won't be a difficult one to work out. Let's see. Well, that's just the definition of a Fourier transform. I'm trying, I'm hoping that I will be able to write Rx as a, an integral over all the possible frequencies with a weighting function, capital F of K, that captures this particular case. And I know that F of K, oops, I apologize. I see that I put a, a DX up there, but of course it's DK because the uh, when we write the uh, function in terms of being built as a, as a bunch of frequencies with a weighting function, we must integrate over the frequency, the spatial frequency. Uh, but then the weighting function itself is as written down here, oops, uh, as written down here, our standard format. But now we have rather a nice function here. It's only uh, either plus one or minus one. But that may still give us a bit of a trick to integrate. Let's see what it looks like. All right, well, it's simple enough to write down, but it may still be a challenge for us. I can tell you that these two integrals actually come to the same thing, so we only need to work out one of them, and you can convince yourself by change variables that they actually have to be the same thing. So I'll choose the one that's over the range zero to positive infinity. Looks tricky. I could do the integral as it stands, but then the, the, the when I feed in the limits, it won't make sense. So what I need to do is, again, a trick that I don't know if the viewers of this on the whole will have met before, it's a, another very powerful trick. We're using a lot of powerful tricks, a lot of heavy weaponry in this lecture. Um, we're going to use what's called an integrating factor. So we're going to say that this is the limit uh, of, um, well, I'll write it and then I'll explain it. So I'm saying that the integral I want to do is the limit as delta, which is now just, just some symbol, I'm running out of symbols, uh, delta goes to zero of this other integral. So you can see that if I just substitute in zero, Oh, and I've made a sign slip. There we go. Now, if I, su if I substitute in zero, I get my original integral. And I can do this smoothly, so there's no kind of sudden jump or discontinuity at zero. But now the point is, the more complicated looking integral with the extra delta symbol, I can do. Let's do it. There we are. The complex number delta plus ik is just some constant, so I can just do that integral. And now it will make sense when I put in the limits because, uh, so I've put in the zero uh, limit where the e to the minus some constant times x is just one, and the, infin the infinite limit is now uh, just gonna give me a zero because that delta as a finite, I should have said uh, positive, I'm, so delta is a positive number, but it comes down to zero, approaches zero from the positive direction, we would say, um, and therefore, when we put in x is infinite, um, then, uh, that will give a, a zero limit. So now we can just uh, substitute in delta is equal to zero and find out what we've got. There we are. So it's simply uh, one over i k or minus i over k. So the answer to the integral is a simple expression, but we needed that integrating factor in order to be able to work it out. But we're nearly done. I mentioned that uh, both the integrals up here come to the same thing. And so our weighting function f of k, we can now write down. 
done and having found the weighting function we can go back and write the integral integral form of our original function our r of x there we are we've just substituted that straight in it doesn't look too bad and actually it can be made to look nicer we can cancel the twos of course but the interesting thing here is that anytime we want to we can expand our e to the i k x as cos and sine parts the cos part is an even function and the sine part is an odd function we're integrating between symmetric limits the 1 over k um, is an odd function so in fact this means that only the sine part will survive that integral let me show you what i mean there we are just eliminating the cos term and, and noticing that we have two i's i squared is minus one so that will get rid of the minus in front and give us a very very neat expression finally for our rx we've discovered if we haven't made a slip that it's just sine kx over k integrated over all k. Uh, we could also write that from 0 to pi and double it if we want. I'm not sure which is the nicer form. But that's a very, very elegant and compact expression. And I remind you that what that's supposed to be is this switching function that just goes from minus 1 to plus 1 at x is equal to 0. Do we believe that? Difficult to tell just by looking at the thing. So a good opportunity to just test, because if I've got that wrong, everything else is going to go wrong. So let's just check. Is that a legitimate way to write down r of x? Well, there we are. I typed it in. Um, I think that's what we, uh, we were expecting. 1 over pi, and then I've used Mathematica's numerical integration so that it will uh, just make it a prop. He'll do an approximate integral from my k minus 100 to 100. I reckon that's going to be enough for us to see whether essentially we got the maths right or not. And so we're now going to plot that thing um, from x is minus 5 to 5. Let's execute that. Well, it's taking a minute. And there we are. Let me just uh, make it a little smaller so it's perhaps a little easier to look at. There we are. So is that a function that switches from minus 1 to 1 at x is equal to 0? Yes, it is. Does it have some little ripples on it, which are essentially this kind of Gibbs phenomenon thing that we've been seeing again and again uh, wherever we take a Fourier series or now a Fourier transform and limit its range? Of course, really, it should be an infinite range. Um, well, we see that, but we're not surprised. We know that those little ripples get infinitely um, thin, uh, as we increase the range, and so they don't cause any practical difficulty to any calculation. The point is, this shows that I haven't made a uh, slip, or it indicates that I haven't made a slip in terms of a prefactor being wrong. My 1 over pi factor was correct. We built it. So yes, this is a way to build our switching function, writing it as an integral. How does that help? Let's go back and finish up. Good, with that quick check, we can say yes, that builds the rx function that we wanted. I remind you that that is the time t equals zero limit of uh, our setup, and we know how to go from the time t equals zero solution. Once it's in a cos or sine or complex exponential type form, we know how to make it instantly the full time-dependent solution. We just need to stick in that time factor, and we can do it even into an integral. It doesn't have to be a sum. So let's write that out. We wrote that the um, s x of t, the function that would capture all the interesting stuff of the problem as a full function of time, was, uh, well, it was, rx was just the time t equals zero limit. But now if we put that back in, the finite time, we're going to have sine of kx over k. And now e to the minus, well, it's a matter diffusion problem, so I should use the letter d. Uh, but then k squared t, um, that's it. That's the solution. So we've managed to write down a mathematical expression for this uh, function s, which really captures all the interesting part of the spatial and temporal evolution of our problem. We could then feed this into a computer and just get values out of it. In a sense, we've solved the problem. But it's still written as an integral, and we'd like to explore a bit more about whether we can get it into a more uh, compact form. That is actually a very non-trivial question. And um, the, the sort of struggle to get it into a more compact form, I think, best belongs in the supplementary lecture, um, as the 
I guess, the final topic there. What I'll write down now is the key sort of headlines of that struggle. So what I've pasted in here is, I think, the, the only remarks I want to make in the main lecture here, which is that we can change variables and, and always introduce symbols to collect up constants, that kind of thing. So uh, what I have done with this uh, function is I've changed variables here to uh, this uh, curvaceous n symbol is eta, and so we can uh, change to use that as our dummy variable, but in that way absorb a root dt into uh, the maths. And we can also collect uh, this suspect. We've seen very often this x over root the constant times t um, just into a single symbol. And that gets us a pretty compact form of uh, our integral, but it's still, uh, still written as an integral. Let's see what the solution would look like at this point written fully. There we are. So if we wanted to, to give up that, we would leave it there. But what um, will what I will talk about in the supplementary lecture is that we can go a bit further. Let me write down the, the big result that is the sort of another five or ten minutes of, of discussion. There we are. A classic, it can be shown, uh, but we, we, I will show it in the supplementary lecture. The bottom line is we cannot escape from writing the solution in a fashion that needs an integral to be present, but we can quite fundamentally change the nature of the integral. Instead of the interesting stuff being, so this uh, beta being inside the integral, hiding inside the sign there, it can actually be in the limit of the integral. That's the same thing. You can see there that's beta over two. Um, so that's the, that's the quite sophisticated transformation we can do, and that does lead to a nicer final expression, but still not the kind of closed solution that we're used to. So let's, uh, let's write that out now as the full solution in these terms. Right, so this line was how we uh, originally introduced our function s, and now we've managed to figure out as best as we can what that s object is. Let's have a hard look at it and see what we're dealing with here. It's quite interesting, because for the first time, we've ended up with a function whose x and t dependence is in the integral as a limit of the integral. So um, that is an unusual state of affairs. And the other thing is, we can't do this integral. We, we could have done the integral if it was from 0 to infinity. That was one of the tricks we played earlier. But this is an integral of the Gaussian function, a very simple bell, it's the bell-shaped function. Um, but we're we're asked here to integrate to a certain point, and there is no closed form for that. So this is an integral that we can't go any further with. It's a strange situation, I suppose, since pretty much everything you meet until this point, you can always do an integral, if you're clever enough, and turn it into the standard functions that we use, sines, cosses, exponentials, logarithms, and so forth. Here, we can't complete this integral. Um, the best we can do is to... Uh, give it a name, and in fact, that's what that's what's been done, and it is called, as promised, the error function. So let me define the error function. There it is. That is the error function, a much discussed and important function in mathematics, in statistics, probability, and so on. And uh, it's simply written like that. So the error function is the in the error function of some uh, argument z here is the integral from zero to z of a Gaussian. So if we were to draw it. If we were to draw it, we would see this. So it's it's the area, uh, clearly as z here increases, we sweep out more and more of the area under this Gaussian. As z goes to infinity, um, what we would find is that uh, the area goes to two, over, uh, 2 root pi over 2, and so the error function itself, because of its prefactor, just goes to 1. So the error function goes between 0 and 1. Um, and that's it, really. That is... The first time I imagine that you may have met the error function, and it's come up for us uh, in this solution of how a, uh, a material will permeate into a block. Uh, let's have a quick look at what this is saying about how um, that, that process of, for example, carburization of steel happens. 
we can write out uh, our solution to our diffusion problem now using the error function, which will make it very straightforward to put it into a maths program and see what happens. So first off, let's have a look. What does the error function actually look like? Uh, well, let's scale it down, but as we said, it must, being uh, that integral underneath the Gaussian, it's uh, equal to zero when it's, x is equal to zero, and it tends to one as x increases. Um, so pretty simple looking function. Now, what does it mean for our diffusion problem? Right, I've uh, brought our solution into Mathematica to have a look at it. I've made up some numbers. So I've said that the high concentration in the reservoir is 0 0.8. The uh, initial value is 0 0.3. I've put in a value for the diffusion coefficient using double D because uh, Mathematica won't let me. It reserves D for another thing. And there we are. Let's, uh, I've already typed in what happens for an extremely small um, time instance, so essentially time t equals zero. And there we see exactly what we uh, wanted, which is that the at the very surface of our block, the concentration is at the high value. Or I should do it this way for you. Um, at the very surface of the block, our concentration is at the high value, but then it's at the lower value everywhere else. So now let's uh, run time forward a bit. Right, not much happening uh, yet, but uh, let's uh, keep running time. Okay, now we see a little bit, uh, I don't know if it will even show up for you, let's go five times further. So now we see a little bit of material has diffused into the block. Of course, away from uh, that interface, uh, significantly away from the interface, we're still at the initial condition, but let's uh, boost up to a, a larger amount of time. And we see a slow process as I increase by a factor of five, so now um, we can clearly see that uh, we've um, permeated into the material a bit, but it's still quite abruptly shutting down. Let's go for a much larger amount of time. And we see that um, it's, it's a slow process. So um, that's a, what we expect because we have a square root of time uh, entering into our solution. So we should expect that in order to double how far we've uh, penetrated into the material so that the the shape of the curve looks roughly the same but it's got it's gone twice as far along the x-axis we should expect to have to put in four times the time so let's see if that works at the moment I would say that um, it's dropped down significantly by x is equal to a half and almost back to the initial at x is equal to one let's see if we can make it go twice as far by doubling uh, excuse me by multiplying by four the time so that uh, um, the square root will double. And there we are. I think uh, that's exactly what we want, that we, what we uh, expected to see, right? So it's a slow process and uh, the rate at which the material propagates in, as in if you were looking for a particular concentration and you tracked how fast that concentration point moved into the material, it would be slower and slower, but never completely halting because it's square root of time. Okay, well there we are. So that's uh, the correct solution and it's a very compact expression because the error fun function comes up so often that it has its own, um, it has its own symbol. So that's it. Uh, we finished, at last we finished looking at diffusion problems and we've looked at essentially all of them. <laughs> we've looked at periodic problems which we uh, related either to a series of pipes that would open or to a stack of material that would melt. Uh, we've looked at problems where the initial distribution is a Gaussian, and we've looked at problems where there's a pulse of energy or material that puts all the concentration at one point, and now we've looked at um, a block, an infinite block of material in contact with a reservoir. And by the way, that last one, the one we've just looked at, is isomorphic to the problem of two blocks, two infinite blocks being brought together at the x equals zero and melting into one another. You can have a think about how you would need to adjust the maths to, maths to reflect that, and you'll find that um, it's just a subtle change to the initial condition that when scaled means our solution immediately works. So we've done it all, <laughs> and it feels like it too. Um, so that, that, that we, we've also met in this lecture some pretty powerful techniques that we needed to use in order to solve some hairy integrals that came up. Now the next lecture is on waves, a topic I really enjoy looking at, and we'll see whether the long-promised analysis of a guitar string yields something that is physically correct or not. But uh, thanks for listening.